Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. Well, here's just a fun thing to think about. This video was inspired by a question someone asked, can you make a bandpass filter using just coax? Well, a bandpass filter is kind of like a low pass filter followed by a high pass filter or vice versa. Unfortunately, we cannot make either a high pass or a low pass filter using transmission line characteristics of coax alone with a parallel stub. But we can easily make a band reject filter using coax alone with some pretty impressive reject numbers. Unfortunately, we're not talking about narrow band filters here, which could be good depending on what you're trying to do and how you design your filter. According to my bench experiments, these have a Q on the order of around 110 or thereabouts. So there are two ways to create these filters. The first one is with an open stub. The second is with a shorted stub. And with each of these, there is two ways to accomplish them. And I will show you each of these two ways to do it. Now, by far, the easiest way to do this is with the open stub, which is what I'm going to be talking about in this first video on the subject. It has the disadvantage of somewhat higher emissions because, well, it's an open stub. In the next video, I will cover how to do this with a shorted stub, which is similar to this, but different enough to warrant a separate video with some overlap between the two. This requires more coax, but it has the advantage of lower emissions. Now I've put a link to this second video up in the corner for you. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Now, let's see how this thing works. At the very heart of this type of filter lay the realities of transmission line characteristics and the impedance transformations that occur as we travel down that transmission line. We fold into this reality the idea of a voltage divider. Well, hopefully this has kind of whetted your appetite for a little bit more. Now, let's do some noodling on some transmission line realities so that we can understand what's going on. Now, suppose I have a piece of coax. It's got nothing connected to one end. That means that the impedance at this end of the coax is some very high value. Now, we track the impedance as we move down this piece of coax at a particular frequency. When we reach the place along this coax where the electrical length is one quarter wavelength at the frequency in question, the impedance will be at its lowest value nearly a short at that point. Now suppose we were to install a T connector in the midst of a feed line and we take our simple piece of coax here and connect it to our T. The physical length of the coax is such that its electrical length is one quarter wavelength at a particular frequency of interest. We leave the other end of this coax open, just cut off clean. At the frequency at which this stub is one quarter wavelength long, it will present nearly a short across the transmission line that it is attached to. Any signal traveling down that feed line at that frequency will be shorted out at the T by this coaxial stub. Now we have a band reject filter at the frequency in question. My bench experiments show an attenuation of around 30 to 40 dB just doing this. We can do even better than this though. Say we want more than 30 or 40 dB of attenuation. Well, how do we do that? Continuing with our transmission line impedance transformation realities, if we have a short at one end of the coax, then we're going to see a high impedance at the far end of a quarter wavelength piece of coax. Now, with this in mind, let's think about it for a moment. We have our T connector here, 
our quarter wavelength piece of coax that's open at one end, we have a low impedance here. So we have a low impedance at this first T. Now, what would happen if I were to take another quarter wave piece of coax and connect it into our transmission line like this? Now we have a low impedance presented here because of how this piece of coax operates. We're, we're going a quarter wavelength to the next one. Now we have a higher impedance over here. We take another piece of quarter wave coax and we connect it over here. It's open at one end. It's presenting a low impedance here. This side, the input side, is presenting a high impedance. Thinking of a voltage divider, input impedance is high, output impedance is low. We have a significant reduction in the voltage of the signal. And that is very true here as well. By adding this second T, I now have a total of attenuation of 70 dB and more at the frequency in question. Now that we have an idea of how it works, how do you design one? Designing one of these begins with knowing your materials, specifically the velocity factor of your coax that you're going to use. No matter what you do, you must know the velocity factor of your coax if you're going to do this. Now, you can find this on the data sheet for a specific coax that you plan on using, or you can measure it for yourself using one of several methods. I outline these methods in my video series on this subject, and I put a link to the first video in this series up in the corner for you. This velocity factor must include everything associated with the stubs, the connectors, the adapters, everything. The next step is to determine the specific frequency that you want to notch out using this band reject filter. Let's call this F sub zero. The design all revolves around one quarter wavelengths of coax, so our first step is to calculate what these lengths should be. To do this, we use this very simple formula. The physical length of our coax is equal to 0.25, that's one quarter times the speed of light, times the velocity factor of our coax, all divided by the frequency that we're interested in. The speed of light in free space needs to be in whatever units make sense for you. The units that you choose for the speed of light determine the units of the physical length that you end up with. I've provided the value of the speed of light in inches per second and centimeters per second in the description. Now, let's apply this to a real-world example. So here's my scenario. Suppose that there's a nearby television station on a VHF high band on channel 11, which is causing someone problems. Now, channel 11 resides between 198 MHz and 204 MHz. The video carrier lives at 199.25 MHz, and the audio carrier at 203.75 megahertz. Now, you can find these values on the internet if you need them. So, suppose we wanted to create a filter to get rid of this signal. It would be nice to get rid of both of these carriers. So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut the first stub to get rid of the 199.25 megahertz video carrier and the second stub to get rid of the 203.75 megahertz audio carrier. Because these two frequencies are in close proximity to each other, they will augment each other to some extent. The quarter wavelength coax between the two stubs will be one quarter wavelength at the frequency of interest for the second stub because the second stub and this link work together to create the frequency-dependent voltage divider. So, physical length, 0.25 times the speed of light times the velocity factor divided by the frequency. Stub 1 ends up being 9.774 inches or 24.83 centimeters. The connecting coax and the second stub ends up being 9.558 inches or 
0.27 centimeters. So is it possible to totally precisely cut coax to an exact length, including the connections at the ends? Not in my experience. Is the coax velocity factor exactly what the data sheet says it is, or even what we measured it to be? Mm, nope. Thus, I will be cutting the connecting coax between the two T's to the calculated one quarter wavelength at 9.5 inches or 24.13 centimeters. But I will cut each of the stubs a little long and then trim them to tune. So pulling a number out of the air, maybe a half an inch or 1.27 centimeters longer than calculated. And at these frequencies, this will be much more than sufficient. The lower the frequency you're dealing with, the longer this would be. So I cut stub one to 10 and a quarter inches or 26 centimeters. I cut the connecting coax to 9.5 inches or 24.13 centimeters and I cut the second stub to 10 inches or 25.4 centimeters. Now I put the assembly together as you can see here. If I were to be making this for a permanent assembly, I'd be using BNC connectors and BNC T's instead of soldering it all together like this. But just so you know how I did this, I stripped 1 8 inch or 3.2 millimeters of the outer sheath off of the end and then cut down to the center conductor about a 16th of an inch or 1.6 millimeters from the end. Now using solder paste to ensure quick and reliable soldering, I soldered the center conductors together first. I checked for and resolved any shorts between the shields and the center conductors. Then I wound some number 24 gauge wire around the shields and then using solder paste I quickly soldered the 24 gauge wire to each of the shields on both sides of the assembly. I checked for and resolved any shorts between the shields and the center conductor. Now these connections are anything but mechanically robust. So I secured it to a piece of scrap wood using some cable staples, as you can see here, once the entire assembly was complete. Now, let's see how this performs right out of the assembly gate. What are my expectations? The filter will be low in frequency. And as you can see here, I was right. So the next step is to adjust this. The process of adjustment is to simply slowly trim the stubs until the filter frequency is where you want it. The higher the frequency, the smaller the length we trim off each time. I will trim the stub responsible for the upper reject frequency first. This is stub two. I will trim off 1 8 inch or 3 millimeters at a time and then check for the reject frequency. Each trim turned out to be 2 megahertz change in reject frequency, so you can see how picky it is at these frequencies. I ended up trimming the coax five times, which amounts to about 5 eighths of an inch or 1.6 centimeters. And take a look what the response looks like now. Now I will trim stub one, which is responsible for the lower frequency. I ended up trimming it seven times, which amounts to about seven eighths of an inch or 2.2 centimeters. You can see how the response looks. Now it turns out I trimmed just a little bit too much, but the response still really looks good for getting rid of that pesky channel 11 signal. But you know, there's a better way that allows for a shorter stub and potentially some adjustment that does not include trimming your coax. Let me show you how this works. Suppose we were to terminate our open stub with a capacitor. This fools the system into thinking that the stub is longer than it really is. Now we will need to utilize a Smith chart to calculate the values to make this work. Don't let this scare you away.
I will step you through it one step at a time. It's actually very simple. This capacitor could be a fixed capacitor or a variable capacitor like this one here. Now, it looks pretty funky, doesn't it? But it's actually a very simple design. I mean, check this out. We have an end connector here. Soldered to the center conductor of the end connector is a copper rod. This one happens to be silver plated. And then we have a plexiglass rod drilled out so that it fits over that copper rod. We have a tube which is big enough so that the plexiglass will run in and out of it. In the end of the tube we have little slots that have been cut so that we can secure it in place using a hose clamp. And then this just fits down over top of this and screws into place just like that. Variable capacitor, we pull it out, we, we go down in capacitance, we push it in, we go up in capacitance. Simple as that. Okay, so now there's two ways to figure out how much of everything that we need. In either event, you'll need to know three things. First, you're going to need to know the velocity factor of your coax. Second, you need to know the characteristic impedance of your coax. And third, you need to know the frequency of interest that you want to filter. Now, there are two ways here. Way one, you have a really cool variable capacitor like this one. And you say, I want to use this capacitor. How long does my coaxial stub need to be in order to use this as my terminating capacitor? Now, these particular ones that I have here have a variable capacitance from 9 to 18 picofarads. So, I'm going to design my filter around a 13 picofarad termination capacitor. Way two, you've dug around in your junk box and you found some really cool, already prepared cables. And they're a particular length and you say, hmm, what capacitance do I need to make these work for my filter? So for this demonstration, I know, first of all, my measured velocity factor for my stubs, including all the terminations, we're talking about the T's and the uh, adapters here from B and C to N, everything, the velocity factor of this whole thing is 0.648. This is RG55AU, and its, its characteristic impedance is 53 ohms. I need to know that. The frequency of interest is going to be 150 megahertz. So, let's start with way one. So, where do we begin? Step one. We calculate the capacitive reactance of the capacitor that we have at the target frequency. And to do that, we use the age-old equation, 1 divided by the quantity 2 times pi times frequency times the capacitance. This gives us 81.6 ohms at 150 megahertz. Step 2. We have to normalize the capacitive reactance to the characteristic impedance of the coax, which in this case is 53 ohms. So we take our 81.6 ohms of our capacitive reactance, we divide it by 53, which is the characteristic impedance of the coax, and that gives us 1.63. Step three, this is where we get to break out the Smith chart. We have to plot this 1.63 on the Smith chart. And this resides on the edge of the lower half of the Smith chart, as you can see here. And we're just going to place a dot right at that spot. Step four, we draw a line from the center of the Smith chart through the dot that we just made to the edge of the Smith chart. Step five, now we read the electrical length of the coax in wavelengths off of the inner scale on the edge of the Smith chart. We'll call this the electrical length, which ends up being 0.1625 wavelengths, 
at our 150 megahertz. Step six, we have to calculate the physical length of our coax from the electrical length using our target frequency and the velocity factor of our coax. Again, the physical length is the speed of light times the velocity factor times the electrical length, all divided by the frequency in question. This gives us a physical length of 8.285 inches or 20.95 centimeters. Step seven, calculate the length of the interconnecting cable between the two T connectors. This cable needs to be a genuine one quarter wavelength at the target frequency. So we use the quick formula. The physical length is equal to the speed of light times the velocity factor times 0.25. That's the electrical length we want divided by the frequency. And that gives us a physical length of the interconnecting cable of 12.75 inches or 32.38 centimeters. So there you go. It just so happens that I have some previously prepared coaxial cables which are just the right length, which brings up way number two. So I've rescued some already prepared cables out of my junk box that I want to use for this application. I've measured the velocity factor of the cables, including all of the interconnecting adapters like this one here, BNC to N and the BNC T at 0.648. The overall length of the cable plus all the interconnecting adapters that's going from the center of the BNC T here all the way to the reference plane of this connector which is about here is eight and one quarter inches or 20.95 centimeters. So what capacitor value do I need to make my 150 megahertz filter? Well, step one, we need to calculate the electrical length of the cable assembly in wavelengths. The electrical length is equal to the physical length times the frequency in question, all divided by the speed of light times the velocity factor. This piece of coax with its interconnections is 0.162 wavelengths long at 150 megahertz. Step two, now we go to the Smith chart. Moving from the left edge of the Smith chart and moving around counterclockwise, we locate this 0.162 on the inner scale of the outer edge of the Smith chart, and we place a dot there. Step three, we draw a line from the center of the Smith chart out through the dot that we just placed on the edge. Step four, we read the normalized capacitive reactance off the Smith chart. Well, I pulled out my calibrated eyeball and I see 1.63. Step five, I now have to take this normalized capacitive reactance that I just got off the Smith chart and I have to unnormalize the capacitive reactance with the coax characteristic impedance of 53 ohms. So I take the normalized capacitive reactance and I multiply it by the coax's characteristic impedance. I get 53 times 1.63. The capacitive reactance that I need is 86.39 ohms. Step six. I need to calculate the capacitance value at the target frequency, giving the capacitive reactance of 86.39 ohms. So the capacitance value is equal to one divided by the quantity two times pi times the frequency times the capacitive reactance. This gives me the termination capacitance of 12.28 picofarads. Step seven, calculate the interconnection cable length. We'll use the same interconnecting cable length for this as we did for way one, which as before was 12.75 inches or 32.38 centimeters. Our fancy termination variable capacitors vary from nine to 18 picofarads. So they'll work 
just fine for our 12.28 picofarad termination capacitor. So let's go see what this all looks like. So here is the whole setup here. We have the input over here. We have the first stub with its fancy schmancy adjustment capacitor here. We have the interconnecting cable here, which is a quarter wavelength. And then we have the second stub with its fancy schmancy adjustment capacitor over here and the output over here. Well, let's take a look at what its response looks like on the VNA. We can see two dips on the screen. Each of these represent the tuned frequency of their respective stubs. So let's tune this for 150 megahertz, which is right in the middle of the screen with the marker. I'm pulling the capacitor out. There's my first stub. Second stub has to go down, so I'm pushing the capacitor in. You can see how they, they augment one another. And there we go, 73 dB of attenuation at 150 megahertz. That is pretty doggone good. Well, now you know how to create a band reject filter using an open stub, and it is so totally fun just to do it and know that you can do it. In the next video, I will show you how to accomplish the same thing using shorted stubs. Now, while the principles are the same, the implementation is a little bit different, so stay tuned. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots!